it is a flawed perception to believe that lower income and first generation people are not smart with their money. Hello, 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 and welcome to More Than Money, a podcast where we have nuanced conversations about money, business, and life, where we take this time to explore the human side of money because success with money is never just about the numbers. I'm your host, Jacquette Timmons, and I am really, really glad that you've taken the time to join me today. And as of this recording, we are now four episodes away from an incredible milestone for us, which is the 200th episode. And while I have received a few submissions, I want some more. So if you haven't submitted a question, please take a moment and go to jacquettetimmons.com forward slash more than money dash 200. Maybe even pause right now and do that. Go to jacquettetimmons.com forward slash more than money dash 200. And yeah, share the question that you have. And maybe your question is like some that have either come in or that have been asked of me during recent speaking engagements, like um, maybe you're dealing with some financial stress right now, you know, in your life or in your business, and you want some ideas on how to navigate that. Or maybe you are wondering if you should prioritize funding your child or your children's college education over saving for your retirement. Maybe you are or you plan to take care of extended family members and you want to set some stronger financial boundaries so that everybody is really clear about what you have the capacity to do and their expectations are managed. Because you want to be able to help, but you don't want to feel guilty about it. And you also don't want to sabotage your financial future. I could go on with, you know, with more examples, obviously, but those are just a few to get your juices flowing. So remember, submit your question and help me celebrate the 200th episode by doing so. And again, go to jacquettetimmons.com forward slash more than money dash 200. And if you tried to submit a question before, the form has been fixed. So no excuse, submit your question. I can't wait to celebrate the 200th episode. And I really can't wait to do so by sharing the question that you have and answering it for you as best I can. And I really hope you uh, appreciate you helping me to do that. In the meantime, let's dive into today's show. Unfortunately, there is a societal narrative that believes only poor or first-generation people need support with money. And it stems from a stereotype that says wealthier individuals and families are A, good with money and always know what to do with it, B, are always self-sufficient, and C, don't require any sort of financial assistance or support. So in other words, The stereotype is they have it all figured out. I've shared this before, but maybe you were new to to the More Than Money podcast and to my body of work. And so let me share again that during my formative years, the formative years of my career, I worked with high net worth individuals and families in the private bank. And I still currently do so in my coaching practice. I have a few clients who are high net worth, whether it's due to what they've earned or how they have invested and built their wealth, or it's because of their family's wealth. And sometimes there are people in the audiences that I am in front of for speaking engagements that fall into that category. I say that because I can assure you from firsthand experience that just because they have wealth and financial security and stability and aren't struggling to pay their bills or to make ends meet, that doesn't mean their experiences with money are free of struggles. And anyone who spends five minutes with me knows how thrilled I am that financial well-being is getting more attention and it's getting more props. And I love that there is a growth in the number of employers and conferences that are really being intentional about featuring financial well-being 
at their wellness table. But I had a recent conversation that highlighted something and it made my ears perk up because it was almost like, hmm, I'm hearing this more and more and more. And the thing that I am hearing is causing me a bit of concern. And it relates to the way that some people are positioning their financial wellness as if only, as if it's only necessary for some and not necessary for all. And from where I sit, this really runs the risk of perpetuating harmful stereotypes and amplifying several biases. And needless to say, I don't like this. Also, if you know me, you know that I despise the phrase financial literacy. Although it grew in popularity in the late 90s and the early aughts, what sparked it was the the what sparked its usage, I should say, was the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977. And this is a federal law that required financial institutions that did business in low and moderate income neighborhoods to help meet the needs of the people who lived in those communities. That makes sense. To meet this requirement though, the majority of the commercial banks and savings associations who opened branches in these locations opted to provide financial literacy training. However, it mainly focused on the mechanics of money, like opening banking and savings account, which is certainly a better option than a check cashing place. So that's good. Um, but it also made it seem like they only needed to teach the basics of money management. And I know this firsthand because I once had as a client, a, a, a nonprofit for whom I had a year long contract and engagement to provide financial literacy training to the people with whom they provided services to. And these were people that were in transition. So you can read that as incarceration to work, welfare to work. And let me tell you, it is a flawed perception to believe that lower income people are not smart with their money. Yet, this is in line with the stereotypes our society often holds about people who fall into this socioeconomic group. And similar stereotypes are being applied to another group of people, first generation. The term first generation is often related to immigration, education, and or employment. And it refers to a person breaking new ground within their family, meaning they are the first in their family to graduate college, working in a high earning profession, or doing both. What concerns me is that these facts can often lead some people to assume that only first generation or people from low income, middle income households require support with money. Again, this to me is harmful and oversimplifies the complex nature of personal finance. Plus it's pretty you know, short-sighted to just automatically believe that high net worth individuals and families don't face challenges with money simply because they aren't struggling with the numbers day to day. But here's the truth of the matter. The stereotypes and the biases regarding who needs support with money and why, that isn't new. And it persists for a multitude of reasons. But today I'm in your ear and on your screen to bring your attention to three. And I've already kind of given you a little preview of one of them because it's about policy initiatives, you know, beginning with the Community Investment Act, Reinvestment Act of 1977, which targeted and marketed financial training as only being needed by a specific socioeconomic group based on the institution's perceived needs of this group. And quite frankly, I just think it's lazy. But that aside, here's where my concern comes into play. If employers and conference organizers and designers are not careful, 
from the standpoint of who they quote unquote market their financial well being offerings to, well, then they too run the risk of perpetuating a similar belief and practice of thinking only their first generation employees and attendees need programming of this nature. That's not true. Everybody needs it. It's just a matter of what you might want to focus on depending upon where someone falls along the income and the wealth spectrum. So that's the first, to me, the first issue is the policy initiatives. Connected to that is the history. And it's really hard to separate historical practices from historical policy initiatives, particularly when you consider that certain social programs were created and targeted for specific socioeconomic groups. Again, think of the nonprofit that I referenced earlier. The third though, um, it really kind of makes me pause and it's media. And I don't mean to include all media in this. So let me be really, really clear so no one comes at me that I am talking about some media outlets. And these are the media outlets that often uh, perpetuate stereotypes or reinforce certain narratives, including those related to who has financial knowledge, who has been ex exposed to financial best practices, and thus is presumed to be good with money. And my stance is this, if media can contribute to the perception that only poor and first generation people need support with money, well then they can also be intentional about telling the counter narrative story as well. And my whole thing is both stories exist, so don't just focus on one end of the spectrum in terms of the story arc. So that's my issue on the media side. And perhaps I take it a little more personally because you know, I'm first generation when it comes to earnings, but I am not when it comes to being college educated. So my concern about the possibility of employers and conferences potentially being short-sighted and unwittingly endorsing or perpetuating stereotypes of who needs guidance and support with money is like I said, in part personal, but it's also professional. I've already mentioned this before, but you know, my professional concern st stems from what I have observed firsthand in my work. And it is why I think it is faulty to presume that the variances in financial knowledge, exposure, and expectation that it only exists across socioeconomic groups because these variances also exist within socioeconomic groups. So the way I see it, the notion that some people need guidance and support while others don't skips over the subtleties and the nuances of money. And this is why it is so crucial to challenge some assumptions and recognize that financial guidance and support should be based on individual circumstances, needs, and vulnerabilities, rather than these broad stroke generalizations about socioeconomic status or background. And I know it can be difficult because just as the need for financial guidance and support is universal, so too our, are our biases. And we all have them. Biases is a natural part of, a, of, of being a human, of our human experience. And even though we cannot eliminate them entirely, we can work to increase our self-awareness of how and when our conscious and unconscious biases are showing up and influencing the judgment, judgments we make and the actions that we take. Hence, this is my clarion call that we need to challenge the assumptions made of who needs financial guidance and support and why they may need it. And in a really odd way, this is an inclusive approach to financial well-being. And although we don't normally associate DEI with personal finance, from my perspective, this is diversity and inclusion showing up in personal finances. That gives you something to think about.
Well, that is it for today, folks. As always, thank you so much for listening all the way into the end, or if you are on YouTube, watching all the way until the end there. And before you hop, three things. One, the next pricing masterclass is coming up. It is December 7th. Go to jacquettetimmons.com forward slash pricing dash masterclass so that you can get all of the details and determine if it's right for you if you are an entrepreneur and small business owner wanting some support and getting your prices right and together for the new year. So that's what you need to do for that. The second is don't forget about my invitation to join me in preparing to celebrate the 200th episode. We are four episodes away from this incredible milestone and you can submit your question at jacquettetimmons.com forward slash more than money dash 200. And finally, if today's episode sparked an aha or a reflection, I'd love to hear more. So send me a DM on Instagram. Once more, thank you for listening today. If you'd like to show appreciation for this podcast or perhaps this particular episode, please share it so that we can reach more people. And if you happen to be listening on Apple Podcasts, please take a moment to leave a rating and a review that helps us to get you know more traction on that platform. And besides, we'd like to hear what you have to say. And if you'd like to buy me a coffee, here's how you can do that. Go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Jaquette, buymeacoffee.com forward slash Jaquette. I'll be back with another episode and I hope you will join me again then too. But until then, remember, it's about more than money.